One hundred and forty-four years ago today, on the 29th of July, 1878, a total solar eclipse occurred over western North America, the first since the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869. This relatively rare event, coupled with the train's extension of relative ease and comfort into the still undeveloped Far West, sent the staid classes of the East Coast into a frenzy of scientific possibilities. A gaggle of proper Victorian scientific superstars ambled stiffly into the eclipse's path in the hopes of advancing human knowledge. This was the first eclipse deliberately viewed from high elevations, above much of the obscuring atmosphere and its incessant twinkling. The U.S. Congress allotted $8,000, not an inconsequential sum at the time, for eclipse observations. Railroad companies saw an opportunity and offered eclipse discounts while one enterprising Denver newsboy is estimated to have scored the equivalent of $2,000 in modern terms selling bootleg eclipse goggles. Hotels were so packed that people offered to sleep on pool tables, while windows in church steeples facing the eclipse were rented out at 50 cents a view. The de facto first among equals of this awkward migration was Simon Newcomb, at 43, head of the U.S.'s Nautical Almanac office who had established a base of operations in Rawlins, Wyoming. That year, he had already begun research into the speed of light that would see him forge a relationship with Albert Mickelson, whose 1887 experiment to measure said speed would throw a wrench into Isaac Newton's universe and pave the way for Albert Einstein. One notable tag-along on Newcomb's expedition was Thomas Edison, who was determined to get one over on Samuel Langley, head of the Allegheny Observatory, by testing his new infrared detector on the sun's corona. Unfortunately, he arrived too late to construct his own sunshade, and so had to make do with a chicken coop. A still-operating chicken coop. That's all right, he probably thought. Look, all the chickens are out clucking in the yard. Except he forgot that all chickens return to roost when darkness falls, and spent totality in a shrieking, clawing fog of terrified feathers. His rival, Samuel Langley, from his perch atop Pike's Peak, also failed to make an infrared measurement, though the instrument he invented would ultimately reveal the temperature of the sun's corona. Other than that, his stay at the summit was uneventful, though one of his comrades, National Weather Service head Cleveland Abbey, collapsed from altitude sickness and had to be carried away on a stretcher. Also in Newcomb's wake, were French artist and astronomer Etienne Leopold Trouvalot, whose sketch of the event is arguably its most lasting legacy, Norman Lockyer, the discoverer of helium, the only element first observed in space, and James Craig Watson, director of the Detroit Observatory, who had a very particular reason to make the trip. Astronomers had long been aware of a tiny backward shift in Mercury's orbit so-called precession, that amounted to a loss of one of its 88-day orbits every three million years. Urban Le Verrier, the discoverer of Neptune, was convinced that the only culprit had to be an innermost unknown planet, the fabled Vulcan. Watson intended to use the eclipse to finally catch Vulcan once and for all, and during the three minutes and eleven seconds of totality, he was convinced that he had seen it orbiting the sun. Except, Vulcan isn't real. It never existed. Forty years later, Einstein would reveal that, when in proximity to a gargantuan gravity source like the sun, Newton's laws break down, and general relativity must pick up the slack. The only astronomical celebrity to accomplish anything on this spectacularly unaccomplished expedition was the then 59-year-old Mariah Mitchell, comet hunter and professor of astronomy at Vassar. And that was because all she really had to do was observe the eclipse as thoroughly as anyone else on the trip. Five years earlier, in 1873, Boston physician Edward H. Clark had claimed that granting women higher education would atrophy their ovaries. In defiance of this, Mitchell led an all-female troop to Denver to conduct the necessary observations. According to an impressed journalist, quote, With iron-gray curls fluttering under a broad-brimmed leghorn, 
she swept the heavens with a four-inch telescope, or directed with native majesty and grace the operations of her assistant nymphs. She was a figure, and perfectly commanding. Other than womankind, the most direct beneficiary of the 1878 eclipse was the state of Colorado, which had only existed for two years before the event. It not only granted its first college its first telescope, but thrust it onto the international scene at a time when recreational skiing had only just left Norway. More broadly, America itself ultimately benefited, as the eclipse allowed snobby Europe to see the hard scrabble industrial landmass to its west as a scientific power.